Thank you, Casso, and I'd like to thank you and the other organizers for inviting me here today. This is my first time in University of Maryland ever, and it's a beautiful oh. place. <laughs> so uh, what I'm going to talk about today began uh, with a discussion of, with a talk given by Mark Riefel of California Berkeley, and he talked about multi-wavelets and operator algebras. In 1997, back at a joint meeting, one of the joint meetings of AMS and uh, MAA. And he was talking about how he noticed some relationship between his own work on C star algebras and Morita equivalents and uh, projective modules and Hilbert modules and wavelet theory. And then he allowed me to see his notes and we began to think about it. And then after that, uh, I have some more work I'll discuss will be work of my PhD student, Ben Perkis, who's former PhD student, rather, and recent joint work with uh, Frederick Latremoliere, who's another former student of Mark, now at University of Denver. So uh, let me just jump, plunge right in. Uh, we're going to be talking about uh, frames and wavelets, but mostly in the frequency domain. So if you translate what it means for the definition of a multi-resolution analysis into the frequency domain, then if you have a dilation matrix A in, on Rn, then uh, a multi-resolution analysis in the frequency domain uh, becomes uh, a sequence of closed subspaces as such that the, uh, they're nested and one gets carried into the next by the dilation. The union of uh, them all is the closure of the union is L2 of Rn, and the intersection of the union is zero. I mean, the intersection of the, VN, of the Vs, which are these closed subspaces, is zero. And here D, the, the Vs are invariant under modulation. The V0 is invariant under modulation, rather than translation, because we've changed the Fourier domain. And then the way one gets multi-wavelets from the setting is to choose appropriate functions in V0, the, so the so-called scaling functions, and then use filters or otherwise to find these, and then uh, determine via the filters the complement, the wavelet module, W0, such that W0 directs on V0 is equal to V1. So that's the standard setting when you translate multi-resolution analysis theory to uh, the frequency domain. So I'm going to start talking about the n tors. I, I didn't, I, uh, like Lucas, is, uh, my talk is somewhat theoretical, but I decided to have some pictures. <coughs> so this is not, this is the two tors which I grabbed from the internet. <laughs> um, so if you begin to think about this modulation picture of uh, multi-resolution analysis, uh, I guess Mark began to think of putting it in a Hilbert uh, C star module setting. So he completed continuous functions on Rn with compact support. He noted that that had the, the structure of a continuous functions on, with compact support on Rn had the structure of a, a left uh, CTN module, where the n torus is Rn modulo Zn, just by, by pointwise operations, pointwise multiplication. And then here's the inner product, the CTN valued inner product. It's a sort of semi periodization. It's familiar from wavelet theory, this, this formula. And that's why he began to notice that some of his formulas from his Morita equivalents were turning up had turned up already in wavelet theory or were turning up later in wavelet theory. And upon uh, completing this module, we get a module, if you take uh, continuous functions with compact support on Rn and complete it in this norm given by the inner product, one obtains a Hilbert module over continuous functions on the n torus. Now Hilbert modules are in, in general trickier than uh, Hilbert spaces because in general you cannot take orthogonal complements. So it's a little bit tricky. But on the other hand, um, it's, it's known that this particular Hilbert module is just this, the standard uh, countably generated 
Hilbert module over continuous functions on the n-torus. And I should say this was had this module was used, had been used by Zimmerman, who I believe is a student of John, in 1994. And he also developed the notion of projective multi-resolution analysis. A little bit different from us. He was concentrating on bi-orthogonality. And I think uh, Benedetto and Zimmerman also used this module in some of their work. And they denoted it not by C, but by this notation L2 infinity, be perhaps because of this isomorphism. All right, but then it turns out that you can show that uh, the dilation D that I defined before, the Fourier transform of the Fourier you know, conjugate of the original dilation, extends to a continuous map from the C star, the Hilbert C star module C onto itself. And then uh, our version of projective multi-resolution analysis, different from Zimmerman's, is, is, is slightly changed. I'll just give it here, and that's, it's from a paper in 2004. If you have a n by n integer dilation matrix, uh, then a projective which then extends, gives you a, a dilation D on C, then uh, by a projective multi-resolution analysis, we mean a family of closed subspaces of C called Vn, Vj, such that, again, V0 is the initial space. It's a finitely generated projective CTN submodule of C. Vj is V. Uh, J comes from V0 by the dilation operator, and they're nested upwards. And then the union is dense, and the intersection is 0. So it's somewhat similar to our earlier version, except now we have finitely generated projective modules rather than closed subspaces for J greater than or equal to 0. And once you have a projective multi-resolution analyses, we took the point of view mainly of forming uh, module frames. So I'll remind you the definition of a module frame. Uh, Frank and Larson define it as follows. If you have a subset, a countable uh, subset of a, a Hilbert C star module J, we say that uh, subset phi i is a module par a countable parcel of all module frame if you have this relationship with the inner products. And that turns out to be equivalent to this reconstruction formula. You can express any element of your, oh, this should be a J, sorry. Any element of your J in terms of the, the module frame. So you're most interested in constructing module frames which were not uh, orthogonal. They, they, they were module frames. I can't say we put them into any particular application, but it was a interesting theoretical uh, exercise. We found uh, projective module frames from these non-free projective modules. And in the nesting of projective modules that are finitely generated overcomes the difficulty with these uh, orthogonal complements in the Hilbert in the Hilbert module. You can nest them up, and at each stage you can take orthogonal complements, and you can represent the Hilbert module as this direct sum of uh, these, these subspaces. And then I had one of my students work on this, uh, Ben Perkis. I said, how can you, can is, is it possible to generalize this to the irration, irrational rotation algebra? So we had our torus previously. Let's go back to our picture. Uh, then you can deform deformation quantization of, of uh, continuous functions on the two torus gives you these irrational, these uh, rotation algebras with a parameter alpha. And they're twisted uh, group C star algebras over Z2, and more generally for the n torus over Zn. And he was able to modify the definition somewhat for uh, the case where the underlying algebra is a cross product of a unital C star algebra by a commutative C star algebra by a, an action of Z. That is a transformation group C star algebra where the action is Z. And then it could generalize to Zn. But in so doing, he had to give up 
the dilation. For the, three, for the free module case, he could construct his uh, definition of uh, projective multi-resolution analysis by having a densely defined dilation on the Hilbert module. In the non-free case, you had to sort of give it up. But in general, he was able uh, to construct what he called a projective multi-resolution analysis for these, uh, let's say A alpha is just the non-commutative two torus. That's what he concentrated. If you have any finitely generated projective A alpha module, and they're all known, they're all explicitly constructed by work of Riefel, um, then it's possible to find an increasing sequence of closed subspaces with the initial space isomorphic to C0, the module that you have chosen, such that uh, they're nested, the union is dense, and the intersection is zero. Now his construction turned out to be very uh, different from ours because he had to use, he didn't use, uh, he didn't complete the C, uh, R, C, C, R2, rather he, he looked at a mapping torus construction. And, and again, the dilation sort of disappeared in this setting, although you do have the dilation and ordinary wavelet theory to construct in the, in the free module case where C0 is just A alpha itself, he, he used ordinary wavelet theory to construct the module. And then he used Morita equivalence in the general case. Morita equivalence is a equivalence between C star algebras where the, uh, that shows that the representation theory is equivalent, strong Morita equivalence of the two C star algebras. And that's a notion due to Riefel as well, but I guess it came originally from algebra due to Morita. So uh, I was talking to Frédéric Latremolière about this, and we began to think about uh, other objects rather than uh, non-commutative uh, tori, which are twisted Z2 algebras. We began to think about non-commutative, what we call non-commutative solenoids, which were twisted algebras over a different discrete group. And it turned out these are direct limits of non-commutative tori. And then we began to think in the direct limit case, is there a different notion that of this multi-resolution analysis that might be more useful in, in that setting? And it turned out we came up with a different notion, which again, not so useful for, not yet as yet useful in applications, but of, is of interest to us for our, just out of curiosity. This is not a non-commuted solenoid or a commute. This is not a solenoid, but it is a, a, an approximation via six iterations of a solenoid. And it comes from just winding in the, the two torus on itself, however many times, six times. Right? Again, grab from the internet. So here is our non-commutative solenoid. Um, P is an integer. P is greater than or equal to two. And then we take Z adjoin one over P, which is a, just all fractions having powers of P in the denominator. So that's a discrete group. This is a direct limit group, a direct limits of copies of Z. Then uh, because it's a direct limit group, it's Pontryagin dual is a inverse limit compact abelian group. And I denote it by uh, zi, where the zi are elements of uh, the circle, and zi plus 1p is equal to zi for every i. And that's the group called the, the p solenoid, denoted by script sp. And then the pairing between uh, the group Z adjoin 1 over P and, a solenoid is, and, it, and the solenoid is given by fol as follows. If you have a fraction K over P to the J, when you pair it with Z to the, the sequence Z sub I, you just take Z to the J to the K power. And then you have this map pi J from the P solenoid onto the circle. These are these projection maps for each, uh, for each index I. You have these projection maps, and you can use them to define the topology on uh, the solenoid. 
Even our non-commutative solenoids, taking a notion from non non-commutative uh, tori, are just uh, twisted group C star algebras corresponding to two copies of this Z adjoin 1 over P. So what you do in general when you have a twisted group C star algebra is you take a, a multiplier on uh, the group gamma, and that's a, a two co-cycle with values in the, in the circle. And then uh, you can convolve elements. If you take compactly supported functions, f and g, on gamma, you can convolve them like so. You sort of twist the convolution via the multiplier. And then you have an involution like so. And in fact, this is defined on L1 of capital gamma. And then when you take uh, the C star uh, enveloping algebra, you get a C star gamma sigma, the twisted group C star algebra. So when you calculate all multipliers on this Z adjoin 1 over P Cartesian product with itself, it turns out every multiplier uh, corresponds to the el an element of the solenoid, the P solenoid, like so. I, I've now written the P solenoid additively, say the, the product is J goes from 1 to infinity of 0, 1 sub J, and then you want P times alpha J plus 1 equals alpha J plus K. And, and then you get uh, the multipliers defined like so. You have, you have a, here's an element of gamma, and here's the second element of gamma, and here's the twist. And this non-commutative solenoid, let's call it script A sub alpha. And then it turns out, not so surprisingly, that because the gammas are direct limits of Z adjoin 1 over P, uh, of Z cross Z, really, you can write it as a direct limit, then in fact you can write uh, the non-commutative solenoids as direct limits of uh, C star algebras, of the irrational, rota or, the ir or irrational, they don't have to be irrational. And this is the embedding that you take to go from alpha A sub alpha 2J into A sub alpha 2j plus 2. So you embed on the evens, although you could choose any embedding you want. You can go as far off as you want and start embedding. I started with A alpha 0, but you can go further if you want. That's the beauty of direct limits. And uh, with that notion in mind, we begin to say, OK, is there a way, if, when we take our non-commutative solenoids, is there a way to define, um, to define some, non some projective module structure on them? And of course there is. And we wanted to use the direct limit, because we wanted more generally, hopefully, to have like a whole theory for direct limits. That's a more general program coming up. But let's suppose we have just a general sequence of unital C star algebras and uh, take the direct limit, uh, and suppose the direct limit C star algebra is also unital. And then suppose you have a finitely generated left projective, and let's call that direct limit C. Suppose you have a finitely generated proj projective left C module. Then we say we have a projective multi-resolution structure for the pair Cx if we have a family of closed subspaces of the module X such that and we call them Vj, as j goes from 0 to infinity. We're missing the negative indices now. We can't get around that. Such that for every j greater than or equal to 0, Vj is a finitely generated projective Cj submodule of C. So Vj is acted on by Cj. And then the inner products of Vj with itself is equal to Cj. So Vj is. And then they're nested, of course. And then the union of the Vj is dense. Again, you're missing the dilation. In general, you cannot expect to have a dilation as such, because the C0 would not be isomorphic to the C1, and the C1 would not be isomorphic to the C2. They're changing. They're sort of increasing. Now here's a baby toy example that ties into the solenoid. Just as I said, the, the continuous functions, the solenoid is the inverse limit of uh, the, the torus. 
So therefore, continuous functions on the solenoid can be written as direct limit of continuous functions on tori, where here is this map from phi zero of, of continuous functions on, on the circle into itself is just given by raising uh, z to the p power. So when you take this direct limit, this, this map preserves the unit, and uh, you get just continuous functions on the p solenoid. Right? So see, so, uh, and then this, when you just consider that continuous functions on the p solenoid is a free module over itself via this notation, then you get uh, that continuous, you can just set up this projective multi-resolution structure by just taking vj equals cj with this standard, you know, inner product. Just take the inner just take the, the, at each stage can consider continuous functions on the circle that are, have, that look slightly different. You know, you go further along, you allow more, uh, you have more information as you go along. But each of them is isomorphic to continuous functions on the circle, all these CJs. So this gives us a projected multi-resolution structure. And then of course we were interested, uh, in direct limits of, of unital C star algebra, just more general that didn't more generally that didn't have to be commutative. So, if you do have a direct limit of unital C star algebras, and then you have any full projection, in in A zero, and then you let V J be the Hilbert A J module, this where V J is A J times P, and then here is your inner product structure. Then when you take uh, your large module C to be the direct limit C star algebra script A times P, then you get that A J times P as J goes from zero to infinity is this projective multi-resolution structure for this pair. So what's the difference between this projective multi-resolution analysis and projective multi-resolution structure? Well, you have you have less structure in the structure, so to speak. <laughs> so uh, in projective multi-resolution analyses, there's a fixed C star algebra, C, and a fixed Hilbert C, mod C module, C X, which is not necessarily finitely generated. In fact, it was infinitely generated in the, the case we were looking at, such that and you have this sequence, in fact, you had an infinite sequence from minus infinity to infinity of, of subspaces as the union is dense. But in the projective multi-resolution case, structure case, each VJ is finitely generated projective CJ module, but not necessarily a C module. So each VJ cannot be a C module because the C is too big for VJ to be a C module in our case. But if you look at the other hand, at the, at the construction of the, um, the original Hilbert module that we considered, then in fact this C can be given, if you modify the inner product at each stage, you can give C the structure of an AJ module for AJ equals CR2 modulo 2, 2 to the minus J times Z2. And then these AJs are again nested increasing sequence. The norm changes at each stage if you give a different norm making it into an AJ module, but it is equivalent to the original norm. You know, it changes by a power of two, equivalent via a power of two in this case. So C is a countably generated Hilbert AJ module for every J, but on the other hand, C is too small to be a Hilbert module for the direct limit algebra of these, which is uh, continuous functions on the Cartesian product of the two solenoid with itself. So we began to consider, okay, let's construct our projective, uh, or ways to construct. There's various ways I mentioned already to construct continuous uh, functions to construct a projective multi-resolution structure is just find a projection, but we decided to use the p-adic field and see what we could get out of that. Remember the p-adic field QP is defined as a collection of sums of this form, where 
it's totally the sum as uh, it's locally compact, totally disconnected, and we're going to have PB prime, so we have a field of formal sums of this type. And then the ring of p-adic integers sits inside Zp as a compact open subgroup. And then you can embed um, the additive group of p-adic rationals Qp, Z, a join 1 over p into Qp. All right? And you'll also embed the, the Z, a join 1 over p into the rational numbers, which sit inside the real numbers. And it was Jerry Kamenker who pointed out to me that, in fact, Z adjoin uh, 1 over P, when you inject it into QP cross R via the diagonal action, the quotient, in fact, is the P solenoid. He said, he noted to me when I was giving a talk based on earlier work with, uh, in, at a conference, he said, oh, you know, Jack Spielberg and I and uh, Ian Putnam thought about this. You have this nice quotient onto the solenoid. So in fact, we have a, a map of Z adjoin 1 over P Cartesian product with itself into the Cartesian product of QP cross R with itself. And then the quotient is just SP cross SP. And then this turned out, because QP cross R is a self-dual group, this turned out to be a perfect setting uh, to use uh, the work of Riefel on Heisenberg representations. Because if you just take M to be the abelian group QP cross R, because it's self-dual, you can define modulation operators on continuous functions with compact support on M. You can define translation operators on continuous functions on compact support on M. And uh, Riefel has a whole theory of, of such, such uh, actions of this type to get uh, Morita equivalences. He was he developed his theory to, to discuss higher, gener higher dimensional non-commutative tori, but it holds in general when you have a closed subgroup, so it holds in this case. And then he was able to get uh, Morita equivalence with C between C star D, where D was this lattice of some sort in M, and eta was a Heisenberg uh, co-cycle. And another twisted group C star algebra, C star D perp, and eta conjugate, where eta conjugate, okay, so you just, the D perp was defined via the eta, the symmetrizer, come from the symmetrizer multiplier corresponding to eta. And then these turned out to have the same representation theory, although not necessarily be isomorphic. They're strongly Morita equivalents. You complete uh, the continuous functions with compact support on M, and you get uh, this bimodule between them. So in our case, we, were, we constructed a family of embeddings, but let's just concentrate on a special one. If alpha is uh, ama the particular, let's fix the theta, and then take our alpha, our multiplier corresponding to theta plus 1, theta plus 1 over p, et cetera, theta plus 1 over p to the j, and then define this embedding of z adjoin 1 over p squared into qp plus r squared by so. Here's the theta parameter. And let's call d theta the image of i theta. And then when you compute uh, the Heisenberg multiplier on d theta cross d theta, it just corresponds to this multiplier here on our non-commutative solenoid. Okay. And then, uh, in fact, C star D theta perp, A to conjugate, is also a non-commutative solenoid. So, and both of them are direct limit algebras, and you can explicitly write out the direct limit bimodules between them using the p adic structure. <coughs> so I had to, we had to bone up on p adic wavelets, and we found work by Shelkovich and Skopina by Emily King, by Benedetto and Benedetto. So we sort of modified what had been done there again a bit to the, the Haru piatic wavelet, because we were just wanting it in one component. And we embedded, we found these VJs to embed inside here. They were just uh, corresponding to Riefel's original equivalence by modules between the, the this initial, the pieces of the terms in the direct limit. OK. 
Okay, and then we were able to construct an explicit uh, multi-resolution structure, projected multi-resolution structure in this case. All right, so, and Shokovitz and Skopina, and I was, as I say, was reading these other, other uh, papers as well, and that gave us our way to, we modified it slightly to get our projected multi-resolution structure. Now, there is a, there is tr there had, they've done a lot of work on wavelets on piatics, Benedetto and Benedetto, Emily King, Shelkovitz and Coast Copina. But, you know, there you could think this is more appropriate what we're doing now for, to study Gabor frames. So, so if you take the, the d theta that I just described, that lattice, and then consider the Heisenberg uh, representation of d theta on L2 of QP cross R, then because we just have a, we have a finitely generated projective module here, we can find a particular window function such that pi dg is a parcel of frame for L2 q cross r. And this depends heavily on the work of Franz Luf, a student of Feichinger now at Trondheim, who developed, showed that the work of Riefel could be used to analyze Gabor frames. And then it becomes very straightforward just to say, oh, once you have the projection, then you can find, you know, you could find the Gabor window function. That gives you the Gabor window function. And then once you embed, uh, do a different embeddings of lattices in QP cross R, you would get finite families of Gabor window functions in L2 of Q cross R. Q this should be a P, sorry, QP cross R. Sorry for that typo. So anyway, thank you very much for your attention. And uh, thanks again for inviting me. Oh, <laughs> I haven't, but that sounds like a good question. I mean, you certainly could take do you know finite linear combinations of these and see what happens <laughs> oh has has emily thought of it <laughs> yeah that's a good point yeah any more questions okay so before we break for for lunch, I uh, just want to point out that uh, Springer Big Council is having an LGBT here, so they're selling book at discount. So if you can take some time to look at the book. If you're planning to write a book, there are people there who can talk to you as well. So please uh, take the time to, to visit the LGBT.